is that automatically on? Yeah, thanks. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this session on uh, obesity insights, surgery, ICU and beyond. Um, thank you for your attendance. Peter Kruger is my name, and I'm the uh, chair of this session and, as well as one of the speakers. And we, um, what we're going to do is we've got a series of talks from all the aspects of uh, surgery and physiology and metabolism and intensive care um, to, to cover through this topic. Um, there'll be the opportunity for questions and discussions. If those of you who've lodged any questions online, if you're in the audience, um, feel free at the end to put your hand up and identify yourselves and we can just cover the questions in the usual fashion. So we, we might make a start and it's my great pleasure to welcome um, Ian Martin as our opening speaker. Ian's a upper GI surgeon based in Brisbane who uh, has a vast amount of experience um, at obesity surgery and uh, correcting other people's obesity surgery. And, um, and I'd like to welcome him to give us a, a walkthrough about the surgery around um, obesity. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Phil. A lot of those corrections were probably from my own surgery, but we'll, we'll just move on. Um, as you can see, we've certainly evolved with time. And unfortunately, 10% of Australians now are obese, and that's nearly 3 million people. And no developed country has been able to uh, change the tide of the increasing obesity epidemic. Despite the fact that uh, mortality rates escalate with BMI. If you look at this laser pointer here, normal BMI is 20. If you go up to 35 and then 45, you'll see that mortality rates increase up to threefold, looking at a core specific mortality evaluation of 900,000 patients. So with death rates incrementally increasing, and if we look at the risks of other comorbidities on a population of BMI 40 patients, you'll see that the relative risk of type 2 diabetes, lipidemias, sleep apnea, breathlessness, intracranial hypertension, two to five times the risk of all-cause mortality, stroke, endometrial cancer, gout, breast cancers, obstetric complications, reflux, and not the least anaesthetic risks all go up in the obese population. And despite the fact that diabetes, which is the biggest uh, cost to our health dollar uh, medically today, uh, increases exponentially as the BMR rises from 25 to 35, and the obesity average obese uh, surgical patient is 45, you see that in women, this yellow line of age-adjusted relative risk of diabetes goes up uh, quite markedly. Interestingly, when the BMI, when your BMI increases only five points, this beautiful paper in The Lancet showed that all causes of cancer rise significantly as well. And in fact, you look at the risk ratios, esophageal, thyroid, colon, renal, liver, melanoma, rectum, gallbladder cancer, pancreas cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, they all increase markedly with weight. The only two here on the left side of the uh, equation are SCC lung and esophageal SCC because of smoking. And now we know that obesity has a direct causal effect as powerful and potent uh, as smoking. So we're now looking at these patients that we'd consider for surgery. Most of us would consider this normal, but in fact, BMI of 30 is obese, and these patients are physiologically still sick. So why is it that every diet and every form of drug and behavioral modification lasts beautifully for six months, yet we all rebound back after one, two, three, four, five years to be heavier than we ever were before. We see that every day of our lives. Why is it that these patients cannot maintain their weight down? Because we know that only 3% of the population can keep their weight down for two to three years. Is it that the 97% are inherently lazy or eat too much, or are there other phenomena that are uh, to play? We gave a lecture to a conference of 500 GPs uh, last year and asked them whether they felt that obesity is a behavioural problem. Most agreed. We asked the GPs whether non-surgical treatment of obesity is more effective. A mixed bag of responses. We asked the GPs whether diet and exercise is the most effective strategy and 80% you, you know, agreed. 
So let's look at the literature and see whether the doctors in our community are correct. And if we look at our NH and MRC governing body from last year, looking at all the evidence provided for diets, low energy, very low energy, or meal replacement diets, at one year, you do get significant weight loss, but small. And at after two years, that's for those that remain on uh, their dietary schedule. Remember, there's a 90% attrition rate of all diets by two years. Meal replacement is the best way to maintain weight loss, provided you keep doing it for life. And the average weight loss is 6.5 kilos. If we look at physical activity at two years, weight loss of 1.3 kilos, and when diet and activity has been studied longitudinally, three kilos. If we look at drugs, the two most popular in Australia today, Xenical, Duramine, 6,929 patients over 12 months with higher attrition rates, weight loss against placebo, 2.7 and 4.3 kilos. So we all can lose weight substantially for six months. It's maintaining intermediate and long-term results that has been the trick. And so if we look at the results of lap banding published, 34 kilos at two years, sleeve gastrectomy, 40 kilos, gastric bypass, 44 kilos, other forms of bypass, more aggressive, up to 50 kilos. So why is it that uh, we, are, we seem to be able to... Um, our hypothalamus seems to set our rate of weight and no matter what we do, it tries to rebound us back to that uh, level. And this gives us some insight into it. This is mice only live for 200 days. And these black mice are controlled and they've been given their normal diet. And these other black mice were overfed for most of their life for 150 days before their natural senescence at 200. And you see after they've been overfed 50% more calories, they still regulate, so self-regulate back to a normal weight pattern that the controlled mice were given. Similarly, these white mice are controlled, and this lower line is those that were starved. They were given 20% deficient calories for most of their life until retirement age. And then they bounce straight back into fat or fatter than the other mice before. So it appears that obesity is centrally regulated and it homeostatically changes with time. And the next best study was in the New England Journal of medical students who were paid to fatten up and put on 10% of their weight. And they did. And this on the, on the y-axis is their total energy expenditure or their metabolic rate. And you see, when you fatten up, your metabolic rate increases to try and drop your weight down to this centrally regulated, hypothalamically based mechanism. And in fact, interestingly, once they were made and paid to return to their normal weight, their metabolic rate actually fell, such that their new thermostat was set at a slightly higher level. Interestingly, if you starve yourself by being paid to lose 10% or 20% of your weight loss, look what happens to metabolic rate, it plummets. So because of hormonal factors, hunger factors, uh, and metabolic rate factors, the weight rebounds back towards a, a standard line. That's highly suggestive that obesity is genetically endeavoured. And in fact, if you need to prove that, you need identical twin studies, and that's been performed. This beautiful study in the New England Journal of 12 pairs of identical twins were all overfed for 100 days. They were stuck in a house, they all ate twice the natural calories that they needed, and the energy expenditure was the same. Twin A, or twin B, and twin A each put on a certain amount of weight. These little skinny pair of twins, after 100 days, only put on two kilos. They ate the same amount as these fat twins, who each put on 18 kilos. So the weight difference between two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 kilos, after eating the same amount of food, and we all see that in society today. But the fascinating thing is this is a linear plot, almost exactly linear, whereas brothers and sisters are scattered throughout that, uh, that square. And it, it's a powerful suggestion that genetics plays a role. Our next speaker identified with his collaborators the gene that showed leptin deficiency in children. 
the first gene of many genes that are associated with obesity. And after giving leptin, the uh, change in format in this uh, young boy. So if you look at prevention and treatment of obesity, of all the 99 studies done, a systematic review of all randomised control trials, diet, exercise, behavioural therapy, drugs and surgery, the overview and summary platform statement was that childhood obesity, family therapy and lifestyle modification is pretty effective for treatment in the early stages. However, unfortunately for adult, surgery is effective. No other modality or combination showed a clear or durable benefit. So who do we operate on? People that are really fat, BMI of 40 or 35 with associated comorbidities. Nearly all of them have had a history of a failed sustained weight loss program on a supervised weight loss or expensive program. They've had, uh, they should not have substance abuse, psychosis or uncontrolled depression. Wendy Brown and Paul O'Brien uh, in Melbourne, the Monash Obesity Institute, uh, two fabulous research surgeons looked at lap banding, which really uh, gave it a name and a face with the science behind that operation. And they found at two years with the reduction in comorbidities of these things, diabetes, 60% after banding were non-diabetic at one year, 26% improved control, hypertension, 60% were normotensive off therapy. Dyslipidemias were all improved. Asthma, a third had no, no longer had asthma after surgery. Severity scores of those remaining went from 44 to 14. Reflux was largely resolved. A third had sleep apnea preoperatively, 2% at one year, and quality of life all improved and was sustained out to four years for those that had undergone an operation. If you look at fat people, they are depressed. If you measure it formally on the Beck Depression Index, which is really 21 questions covering all nine of the attitudes and symptoms, which are DSM-4 criteria for major depressive illness, we'll see that normal is less than 10, and moderate is you know, 15 to 22, and a major depressive illness is 23. And of their cohort of lap band patients, when they started at a BMI of 44, you'll see moderate depression levels in all fat patients and under 10 is normal, and they, these patients' quality of life is improved significantly and it's sustainable. The same group did the first quality randomised trial comparing skinny fatties with a BMI of only 30 to 35 with one comorbidity associated with, with uh, their obesity, and they compared diet versus lap banding. Purple is lap banding, and this is the percentage of excess weight loss. At six months, as we all know, diet and exercise works beautifully well. But unfortunately, because of this rebound, hormonal and metabolic consequences, weight regain is the norm. And this is because of OptiFast works just as well as lap banding for the first six months. It's because of trace element deficiencies that one can't keep going on drastic uh, meal replacement therapy. We do know that if you do diet and your weight is, and you uh, successfully, that you have to maintain 1,000 calories per day for life to maintain your weight at that lower level. And that's like three small entree size meals a day. This is the Swedish obesity study, a fabulous overview, probably our best res long term results. It captures every obesity surgical patient in Sweden with their national registry data and they had case match controls of obesity cohorts of a further 2,000 patients that had not undergone the surgery and followed them for 15 years. And the results were this. The weight over 15 years on the morbidly obese with a mean BMI of 44 stayed the same over 15 years. And this is percentage of weight loss. Those that underwent laparoscopic gastric banding lost 15% of their body weight, 20% with an older operation called vertically banded gastroplasty, and 30% of their body weight for 15 years. So as you'll see, all surgical operations do really well, and like every other factor, they can increase in weight, but they stay much lower. They sustain long-term weight loss compared to match controls. If you look at their survivability, including anyone who might die with surgery, because it's not a complication-free zone, but if you look at all causes of mortality, there were 129 deaths in the control group, 
and 101 deaths in the surgery group at 15 years. So a meta-analysis looking at comorbidity resolution with obesity surgery showed that there's a reduction, this is with all weight loss surgery around the world, of diabetes complete resolution in 60% of cases, hypertension in 60%, hyperlipidemia is improved in 70%, obstructive sleep ap apnea is resolved in 80%, premature death is reduced significantly, and improvements in quality of life, less depression, greater mobility, fertility, less incontinence, and more potency. And although it appears expensive relative to other treatments, there are numerous papers, including our NH and MRC body, that quotes that it's more, mo the most cost-effective treatment available for a weight reduction. This is a randomised control trial of lap band versus con conventional therapy for diabetes, the most costly uh, complication of obesity. And in this trial by the uh, Melbourne group, diabetes was re complete remission in 72% of surgical patients, 13% of conventional group at two years, with a weight loss of 20% of total body weight at two years with banding, and 1.7% in the conventional group. This is a more aggressive study uh, similarly, a more recent randomised control trial in the Cleveland group of 150 patients randomised to intensive medical therapy, they're all diabetics, intensive medical therapy with sleeves or gastric bypass. These are more robust operations generally and their primary endpoint was proportion of patients with a glycosylated haemoglobin level of 6% or less at 12 months after treatment. And if you look at these results, you'll see that with medical therapy, 12% still have a low glycosylated haemoglobin level that they tried to achieve, whereas it's much higher in the bypass group or the sleeve gastrectomy group. And when they looked at the number of medications used, sorry about the clarity of this slide, the number of medications went up in the control group to three medications, down to half or one medication per average on the operation group. The International Diabetes Federation also has put out a formal uh, position statement in 2011 saying that surgery should be an accepted option for type 2 diabetes and a BMI over 35. And it should even be considered in those with a BMI of 30 to 35 because of randomised trial evidence of improvements, particularly the Indians and the Chinese and other ethnic races have uh, the metabolic syndrome at much lower BMIs compared to the, uh, the Caucasian population. Morbidity and mortality of bariatric surgery is generally low, equivalent or to elective gallbladder surgery, and that bariatric surgery in severely obese with type 2 diabetes has a range of health benefits and all cause mortality. You, being anaesthetist, you all know the operations anyway. There's the lap band, which is, about, which is decreasing in Australia in its prevalence, down to about 20% of all operations. The sleeve, which is having a honeymoon period, about 60% of all operations, and the bypass, which is increasing about another 20% around Australia. The band's the safest, simple, it's easy, but has a higher re-operation rate and a removal rate. The reason being is that these things can, artificial devices can slip or they can erode and the tubing can uh, fray and the port sites can flip. So a higher re-operation rate, still very safe, effective in randomised trials for diabetes and excess weight loss. The sleeve gastrectomy is more popular because it imparts a huge risk to the patient of leak along the staple line, which is still only 1%. And if the patient leaks, they have significant morbidity. They can even die. They can be in hospital for a long period of time. But of the 98, 99% that don't leak, they have, no, uh, they have a pretty uh, stress-free existence for a long time afterwards with significant weight reduction. They do have mild iron deficiency because of iron is absorbed in the stomach and B12 deficiency and multivitamins are required and vitamin B12 blood tests annually. But that's it from a metabolic point of view for the sleeve gastrectomy. It's why we fundamentally like it, provided we think the patient could survive a leak from the staple line. The bypass, which is restrictive, giving the, self, giving the patient a small pouch and this little Ruan wire connection here, is the gold standard, probably gives the greatest weight loss fractionally so, so, so more than the sleeve. However, it does have hormonal and metabolic effects, mainly through GLP-1. But the problems down the track are 
this little join here imparts a 2% risk per annum of life-threatening intestinal obstruction, which is not always detectable on a CT scan. And there are re significant requirements for vitamins and trace element uh, replacement for life. And therefore, this is considered a more radical procedure than the sleeve gastrectomy. So many people around the world are adopting a sleeve gastrectomy and moving on to bypass or more radical procedures down the track, having said that the most research and the longevity is proven for the bypass more than other operations. Randomised trials of the Ruan Y gastric bypass versus gastric banding have been performed. This is a case match study of 442 patients showing that there is more complications in the RUI gastric bypass major, 3.6% to 2. There were no deaths in this study. At three years, however, there was a failure. We call a failure less than 25% of your excess weight loss uh, in 18% for the band, none for bypass. That's the trouble with the band. And that 21% of the band, or a fifth, were removed uh, by six years. So that's the issues we have with an artificial device. It's safe, it's good. And I tend to reserve the band for a patient who I, don't, uh, who I believe would not survive a leak from a sleeve gastrectomy. Cirrhotic, portal hypertension, cardiac cripple, cardiologist said needs their operation to lose their weight or they'll be dead in six months. That sort of a, a patient. And if you look at in, it's hard to get Australian mortality and morbidity. It's poorly uh, recorded. It's clearly higher than what they say here in our own governing body, Medicare, 0.4% complications, 0.2% mortality. But essentially, we're not killing every patient who has the surgery. There is a risk. It's far less than 1% who die from the surgery. And we are creating morbidity if it goes wrong. But the morbidity is still low. And patient satisfaction scores are pretty high. For those Queenslanders out there, I'm sure you recognise this man, George Fielding. He, underwent, he pioneered obesity surgery in Queensland. He underwent his own lap banding 13 years ago and has kept 35 kilos off and now still places the band in New York and uh, he's delighted with the results of resolution of his reflux, hypertension, lipids and asthma. He even has his own YouTube video you can watch if you wish. Sleeve gastrectomy is the new trendy one. Originally it was reported as just really chopping the stomach off at this level and leaving the antrum. However, my brother and I and several around Australia have been doing this extended sleeve where we remove the entire antrum. Why? In other words, you basically trim the whole stomach up. It stops weight regain. And if you look at the swallows after the operation, there's the pylorus, and here's the staple line, and the entire stomach has been trimmed. It's less than 200 mils. There's 85% uh, reduction in ghrelin. So people think like skinny people for the first time in their life. They've eaten their smaller meal, and they stop, they're not looking at that skinny person who's left that beautiful food beside them for the first time in their life. It is very real, and it's reportable, and satiety levels are, are recorded. And so if we look at results of our results of, you know, 700 patients with reduction of, uh, you know, with associated comorbidities, we've had no deaths, trained many fellows, and our results, pleasingly, show a 75% excess weight reduction out to five years. So we are showing that there are some really good results that can be achieved with this extended sleeve gastrectomy. And if you look at the results of the Swedish obesity study and extrapolate our own results so far, even though we are aware that the stomachs do stretch and there could be a reoperation rate, that it is encouraging that uh, we, we are noting that we're expecting to have really good, good findings out over the next 10 or 15 years. Sure, some patients are resistant uh, for certain reasons. They have their sweet tooth, they don't exercise, they do other issues but we, there may be a higher reoperation rate, but we're expecting good long-term results. And more importantly, satisfaction rates by the patient are encouraging, highly satisfied or satisfied. There's always a few, probably those who have had a complication that are less satisfied with a leak rate of 1%. Finally, if you look at quality of life, just to touch on adolescence, their quality of life if you're obese is the same as if you're having chemotherapy or in a wheelchair. And if you look at their, as their after ruin y gastric bypass, if you, as your weight comes down, all forms of quality of life improve for these young patients. Physical comfort, body esteem, psychosocial factors. So in summary, uh, obesity, the evidence base suggests that perhaps it's strongly genetically determined. 
that diet, exercise and drugs don't appear as potent as we'd like with respect to durable weight loss, that surgery is a durable remedy for significant weight loss, it is cost effective, it's very good at resolving the associated comorbidities, it's highly curable for early stage diabetes and it seems to improve quality, uh, longevity and quality of life. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ian. What we might do is save questions till the end, and then we can get everybody up as a panel, so if people just save their questions to the end. Um, it's a, my great pleasure now to welcome our second speaker, and as Ian um, alluded to in his talk, he is highly regarded in the field of obesity research. Um, John Whitehead uh, is passionate about fat and adipose tissue. He's devoted years of his life to uh, researching fat and metabolism, and hopefully he'll give us some of those insights over the next little while. Thanks, John. Thanks very much, Peter. Yeah, thanks very much for the invitation and the opportunity to present. Hopefully you'll be able to understand my language. I speak English, but I'm from a strange place in the UK. Uh, some people think I sound like I'm from Brisbane, but I don't. So I'm going to give you some simple messages today, so hopefully you'll take some of those messages away with you at least. And the first is very simple. So FAT is actually an acronym, um, and FAT stands for Fabulous Adipose Tissue. And so really what I'm going to try and convey today is that adipose tissue or adipocytes are really quite dynamic cells. The endocrine cells, they produce a suite of hormones that control virtually all aspects of our physiology. And so in certain contexts, uh, it's true that we can say that f an, an increase in fat is, is detrimental to our health, but we need an adequate amount of fat to produce these hormones which maintains our metabolic status. And so... From an evolutionary perspective, it's clear that fat was a beautiful thing when food was scarce, and that's not that long ago. But here's a, a depiction of the Venus of Willendorf, who's the goddess of fertility. She's over 20,000 years old now. She's got a rather fuller figure, and she depicts a, a symbol of health, wealth, and fertility. Now, the 21st century equivalent isn't quite as positive. We now associate a fuller figure with chronic diseases such as type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, dyslipidemia and cancer. And really I'm going to hopefully elaborate as to why the obesity epidemic has led to some of these epidemics. But much like Ian in the last talk, I'm also going to highlight that it's not just your health, it's also, I think, partly because of the social stigma associated with obesity, it's your life that's affected. And so there's low self-esteem, depression, social discrimination, which is one of the elephants in the room, and even goes to fewer employment opportunities. So really it's got very far-reaching consequences, not just in terms of health impact, but also in terms of uh, social impact. It's always good to look at definitions of topics that when we're discussing them, and so the World Health Organization would be considered a reasonable place to look at, and they define overweight and obesity as abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that may impair health. And here are some more statistics here that global excessive fat accumulation has almost doubled since 1980. And if you put that in terms of kilograms or tons, that's an awful lot of fat that's on the planet that wasn't here 30 years ago. In 2008, there were more than 1.4 billion adults who were overweight. Over 200 million men and nearly 300 million women were obese. And 35% of adults were overweight and 11% were obese. And I think a staggering number really is that for, more than 40 million children under five were overweight in 2012. And one of the things that I like to remind people is that excessive fat accumulation is preventable, but it's going to take a big effort uh, from societies across the globe to achieve that. So if we look at the obesity sort of landscape, why does obesity lead to chronic metabolic diseases? And really if we look at this schematic, and this is a very nice one, uh, at the centre, what we have is chronic positive energy balance. So we have positive nutrient energy, basically too much energy going into our system. And this imbalance leads to cellular stress. And so we have oxidative stress, uh, stress within the endoplasmic reticulum, organelles within the cell, and a, a number of uh, metabolites within the cell that accumulate. And this forms a vicious circle. And this then spirals out of control, so we get localised inflammation and insulin resistance, and this happens within the adipose tissue. And then this turns from, from a localised inflammatory disorder to a systemic disorder. And so the adipose tissue then starts talking to other tissues, 
on the whole system becomes decrepit and this leads to diseases such as type 2 diabetes, hypertension and so on. So it really spirals out of control and central to this is the adipocytes, which are the uh, heroes or villains of the adipose tissue. And it was in, the, in late 1994 with the discovery of leptin, uh, which hopefully you've all heard of, and this is thought of in simple terms as a society factor. So it's produced by adipocytes and it, it really controls our food intake in very simple terms. And really, since the discovery of leptin in 1994, we now recognize that there are a plethora of over 100 uh, what we call adipokines or bioactive molecules that are produced specifically by fat cells that regulate all aspects of our physiology. Um, and these are produced in a highly coordinated and regulated manner. And so they help to regulate our metabolism and virtually all other processes. And this is a very dynamic system, and so it can be uh, turned up or turned down in accordance with the conditions. But the conditions that we're used to, that we've evolved to exist in, we've now changed. So we're not, we've not been able to keep up our biological systems with our technological systems. And so what I like to do is simplify things. So I think of the adipose tissue or adipose organ as the fat controller because it controls virtually all aspects of our physiology. And in the healthy state, in a lean individual, it's fairly benign, much like the fat controller from Thomas the Tank Engine. But if we become overweight and obese, then the fat controller becomes a bit more aggressive and a bit more angry. And this is largely because of an imbalance of the inflammatory cytokines or adipokines here. And we get an increased production of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. And they lead to, to, to localized inflammation and systemic inflammation. And this is really just a, a, a schematic showing this. So in the normal healthy individual, we have adipocytes within the adipose tissue. We have pre-adipocytes, which are precursors, which can go on to develop into mature adipocytes. With weight gain, what we see is we see an increase in the production of these pro-inflammatory factors. And that's fine. That's part of the natural process. Uh, if we have fairly acute weight gain because we've had a large meal or a few large meals because a kangaroo came hopping by. What we're, what we're not evolved for is this chronic weight gain. Oops, pardon me. And what happens with chronic weight gain is that we continue to produce an excess of these pro-inflammatory factors, which leads to recruitment of macrophages and other uh, blood cells. And this leads to an escalation in, these, in the production of these pro-inflammatory factors within the tissue, which then moves out into the system and leads to inflammation in liver, muscle tissue, and so on. And so there was a seminal discovery around about eight years ago where really there was convincing evidence that was published in Nature that fat cells aren't there for life. Uh, and I'm sure many of you will remember at university and school even that we were told that we were born with X number of fat cells and we died with X number of fat cells. And those were actually the same fat cells that went, through us, went with us through our lives. Well, as, as is usually the case, the dogma from 20 or 30 years ago was wrong. Uh, and in some really elegant studies, what this group was able to show was that approximately 10% of fat cells are renewed annually. And that's really quite interesting to people like me because that means that the relatively high turnover of adipocytes affords us new therapeutic opportunities. So we can change this balance so that we can increase or decrease uh, the number of adipocytes that are either uh, uh, generated or lost. And that obviously gives us an opportunity to, to affect people's weight gain. Now, I'm just going to switch gears a little bit and, and give you an overview of uh, adipose tissue. There are, we tend to talk about adipose tissue as if it's all the same. That's not quite true, just as we recognize that there are different forms of skeletal muscle uh, with different jobs. It's the same with adipose tissue. And so why adipose tissue is uh, predominantly uh, the major form, it's around about 90% of the adipose in our body. It has, its primary role is to, as energy storage, um, it's, it consists of large unilocular lipid droplets, as shown here. So each of these is a fat cell under the electron microscope. And this is the perimeter of the cell. And all the organelles are squashed to the side because the cell is full of lipid. It has very small mitochondria that are disorganized, which you can see here, and no uncoupling protein. Uh, and this uncoupling protein is, in a way, the magic bullet because that allows us to turn excess energy into heat. So it's not stored as energy, which means if we can tickle this system, then it's of great therapeutic value. Brown adipose tissue is the other classic form of adipose tissue, and most investigators weren't interested in this because it was thought that it wasn't present in adult humans. Um, there's been a rethink 
because of some recent evidence which came out from cancer studies. But brown adipose tissue is fundamentally different to white adipose tissue. It has small multilocular lipid droplets, and so you can see the lipid droplets now within each of these cells busting out. They have large mitochondria which are well developed, and they express this UCP1 protein, which allows us to turn excess energy into heat, so it's not stopped. And these are really important in thermogenesis, so small animals that undergo hibernation, etc., have lots of brown adipose tissue. Now, it was thought that adults lost their brown adipose tissue as they came through um, uh, the early developmental stages. Mice, on the other hand, retained it. And really, this just shows how dynamic the system can be. So this is a mouse which is kept at ambient temperature, 28 degrees, and this shows all the adipose tissue in the mouse. And you can see that most of this is colored white. If we keep the, a, a, a similar mouse at six degrees for around about a week, most of this adipose tissue turns to brown. And so it develops this ability to uncouple and produce heat as a survival factor. We now know that the same occurs in humans. We don't know exactly to what extent, because most humans won't live at six degrees. Uh, we now put clothes on and put the central heat on, et cetera. But this whole system is really quite dynamic. And because of PET scans that we use to, ta to uh, monitor how cancers were going, we've now recognized that there is brown adipose tissue in a, probably around about 80 to 90% of humans. It depends on the conditions at which we screen them. But it's particularly prevalent in the neck, the supraclavicular region, the mediastinum, and the paravertebral region. And it seems to be situated around the, uh, <coughs> the blood vessels, excuse me, around the blood vessels. And that makes sense because the heat then can be dissipated throughout the body. What we also recognize is that this is very simplistic and we're now discovering that there are a whole range of different types of fat. These are referred to often as beige or bright and these are somewhere in the spectrum. And so I think it's appropriate to think of adipose tissue within an animal, within a human, as a whole organ and this is regulated in a coordinated manner. And so it can display a whole dynamic spectrum of color and behavior and biochemical properties and functions. And so we have the, the capacity to regulate our adipose tissue to a certain degree. Now, even when we consider a single type of adipose tissue, such as watt, it's not all the same, and you'll hear more about this. And so, in, again, in simple terms, um, there's the apple versus pear. So some people store the extra energy above the waist. Some people store it below the waist, the pear. This is more gynoid in its terms of its distribution. It's much better to store the fat on your bum uh, than on your belly. And even if you store it around your belly, then there's still different types. There can be visceral, which is where the fat is stored internally around the organs, and that's bad for health, or subcutaneous, and this is much better for health. And then if we consider different depots, the, the mental versus the subcutaneous, some really elegant studies from David James' group down at the Garvin Institute in Sydney showed that if we transplant small amounts of fat from different depots, we get very different outcomes, which is consistent with the idea that they have very different biochemical properties and genetic signatures. And so really, it highlights the fact that our adipose tissue from different depots serves different roles. And then some of the work that my group's interested in is that all fat cells aren't equal. So here are, here are two individuals who look superficially, at least, to be identical, both morbidly obese. This person on the right-hand side represents around about 80% of the morbidly obese individuals. They have expansion of their adipose tissue by a hypertrophy of existing fat cells. So as the excess energy is stored, the cells get larger and larger. This leads to the cellular stress that I was mentioning and makes the cells angry or inflamed. So we see an increase in the pro-inflammatory adipokines and a decrease in the anti-inflammatory adipokines. And this really predisposes to all the obesity-related diseases. Now, this individual on the right-hand side, which represents around about 20% of the morbidly obese individuals, is fortunate because they have a much greater predisposition to generate new fat cells. And so as they accumulate more energy and store it within the adipose tissue, they generate new fat cells via a process called adipogenesis. And this hyperplasia really maintains the balance within the adipose tissue, so we get maintenance of the pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory adipokines, which maintains metabolism. Now, unfortunately, in the majority of individuals, there's an inability to generate new fat cells. And really, I think that's because we've not evolved to live in the conditions that we now live with this, this really dense food, uh, low exercise requirements, etc. And so there's effectively a failure 
to generate these new fat cells, and that's why obesity begets these diseases. And this has been uh, demonstrated at multiple levels, not least by looking at gene signatures. And so the overarching staff strategies now of my group, uh, based at the MARTA Research Institute at the University of Queensland, at the Translational Research Institute at the PA Hospital, is to really try and identify novel strategies to combat obesity-related diseases. Not obesity per se, but the diseases associated with obesity. And we've really tried to piggyback on our increased understanding the last few years. And so we know that hypertrophy of fat cells leads to all these diseases. And so we're trying to manipulate the fat cells now to promote hyperplasia. And this has been a complete paradigm shift for us over the last five to 10 years. 10 years ago, we wanted to block the generation of new fat cells because we thought that would make people thinner and therefore healthier. But as the evidence has accumulated, we've realized that would make them less healthy because their cells would get larger and more stressed. So we're trying to generate fit fat cells, which will restore the adipokine profile. It will become less inflammatory. Um, and this, will, this reduction of inflammation will enhance metabolism. And the approaches that we're using here are multifaceted. So we're using sort of uh, sophisticated genetics approaches. We're using molecular biology, cell biology, preclinical models, and also human subjects or tissues from humans. And this is really important. That's one of the reasons why I was uh, pleased to be invited today and to accept the invitation, because we work, we work extensively with human tissues. And so it's very important for us that all the other stuff that we do with all these other different models, we can extrapolate and go back to the human tissue because that's really one of the key things. And so what we hope from these studies is that we can ultimately manipulate fat to enhance metabolism, and this will reduce the incidence of these obesity-related diseases. And as a secondary gain, because of the enhanced metabolism, there will be a slight reduction in weight. And finally, I'd just like to conclude by saying that obesity isn't rocket science, it's much more complicated, which speaks to the societal uh, problems of obesity. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, John. Fascinating. Um, it's now uh, my pleasure to welcome our third speaker. Um, Dan Mullaney is an anaesthetist and a practicing intensive care specialist at the Prince Charles Hospital um, in Brisbane. And he's had a long-standing interest in particularly uh, the outcomes following cardiac surgery, but also intensive care stay of people who are obese. So Dan, I welcome you. Uh, thank you very much. It's my uh, pleasure to speak on this topic. So this is a, an article from the Courier Mail, so therefore it must be true. And uh, surgeons and obst obstetricians say rising obesity rates in Queensland making their jobs harder and putting patient lives at greater risk. Um, and I guess the definition, a paradox is a statement or a proposition that seems contradictory or absurd, but in reality expresses a possible truth. So that's how we come to the obesity paradox. So this talk, we're going to briefly overview some uh, aspects of bariatric medicine. I won't go into the bariatric surgery too much because Ian's covered that extremely well. We will touch on some perioperative issues and the obesity paradox in some detail. And where possible, um, we'll pre I'll be presenting um, predominantly local data and cases, but and fortunately this is from an ICU perspective, so it may be slightly bitter and twisted. We've so talked about the definitions um, and these are the WHO definitions that um, uh, uh, previous speakers have talked about. Uh, and underweight is less than a BMI of 18.5 kilos, and overweight 25 to 29.9 um, kilograms per metre squared. And you'll see that, uh, as the previous speakers have talked about, there is an overlap between those that are uh, obese and healthy and obese and not healthy. Um, I thought it was interesting, um, the, the whole concept of bariatric medicine, which is a... a uh, an area that's receiving more and more attention um, is derived from the term um, you know, baro or baros, weight or pressure, baro, bar, barometric or barometer, and iatrics is the study of uh, medical care or treatment. And a very broad definition, and there are multiple, is that uh, a bariatric patient is one where their weight interferes with their mobility ADLs or affects their health. In, in practical and pragmatic terms, um, less than 1% of males are above about 190 centimetres tall, so a male above 144 kilos or a female above about 130 kilos functionally has to, is managed in a hospital setting as a bariatric patient. 
One of the terms that comes up a lot is the concept of equipment safe weight load. Um, and um, uh, you'd all be familiar from, with this from an operating room point of view or uh, from equipment use. And that's steadily increased over time. And those with a, a weight above about 230 kilos require ultra specialised equipment. So the prevalence has been talked about. On average, the BMI of the entire population goes by up, up by about 0.1 per year and has gone up about three to four kilograms per metre squared over the last 40, 40 um, years or so. And if we just look at the MJA from now, the, more, than, um, more than 10 years ago now, the prevalence of obesity in Australia has doubled in the past 20 years and there's a strong positive association between obesity and hours of television watched and lower physical activity. Um, and um, if you're French, the, weight, the obesity rate was about 12% until fast food outlets join, um, became more and more prevalent in France, and that uh, has strongly correlated with the rise in obesity in France. Where possible, I was going to present local data. So this is from Queensland Health um, through the School of Population Health, and it looks uh, specifically at the Queensland population, um, and they've applied various... Um, models to try and capture the entire Queensland population and basically uh, about 34 percent of the population in adults over 18 is overweight, about 22.9 um, percent is obese and um, the combination of obese and overweight is about 57 percent of the population aged over 18 at the moment. Uh, similar, but not quite as much in children, so overweight in children is, is less in, in the Queensland population, and the nearly 10% of, of the population has either diabetes or uh, high blood sugars. But the self-perceived weight status is quite different, so those that are, uh, people often perceive themselves as being underweight or in acceptable weight when they're overweight. Um, previous speakers have alluded to the NHNRC guidelines, I'd commend them to you. Um, they're an excellent guideline on what's actually happening and they're very up to date at the moment and it's from an Australian perspective. Uh, we can look at, and uh, the audience will be very familiar with this whole idea of the pathophysiology of obesity manifesting itself as comorbid conditions. So, Conceptually, we have weight-related changes, we have physiological changes and pro-inflammatory changes, and this produces the raft of comorbidities that are seen, seen with extreme obesity. Uh, Ian's previously talked about the effectiveness of various interventions and the fact that lifestyle changes, lifestyle change and pharmacotherapy, although initially successful for a, for a small period of time, have a very limited long-term effect it's not that they're not effective, it's just extremely hard to maintain. And then uh, bariatric surgery with maintained lifestyle changes results in significant improvements in weight gain. Sorry, correction, weight loss. Uh, Ian's talked about the common operations, um, gastric bands, uh, ruin Y bypass and sleeve. And less common operations done previously um, duodenal switch operations and vertical gastric gastroplasties are really no longer performed. And then this is some um, local data. So this is uh, as best we can get from, from Australia in the current sort of progress. And it's particularly important and would be seen by many um, people in practicing anesthesia intensive care that of the rapid increase in the amount of surgery being done for bariatric procedures. So, um, Oh, sorry. Uh, you can see that um, previously um, uh, gastric bands were the most commonly performed operation. Uh, mostly s there's a been a, a significant increase in the amount of sleeves being done and the amount of um, uh, gastric bypasses being done. But we also see notably, and this is a quite striking thing from an ICU perspective, is the increase in the amount of revisional surgery being done. And the revisional surgery, and, and Ian may be able to comment further on this, is, is, is a much more complicated option with significant effects. So the patients that have been having gastric bands in the past are now coming forward for revisional surgery, which is very important. When you look at post-op problems, this is a good example. You'll see in the picture here, this is someone lining up for a gastric 
uh, Rouen Y bypass. Um, and that's the gastric band having eroded through the esophagus and the stomach and lying in the peritoneal cavity. So that's not really an ideal way to be starting a, an operation. Um, and clinical signs in the obese patients are really quite hard to detect. And the patients uh, coming forward for gastric surgery um, have substantial amounts of risk, but um, those factors that it do increase their risk would include something, uh, things like a history of thromboembolic disease, um, uncompensated coronary artery disease, unrecognised obstructive sleep apnea, smoking, and those that are um, uh, what class four obesity, those with a, uh, a BMI of greater than 50 uh, kilograms per metre squared. And as we've talked about previously, nutritional deficiencies are significant after get bariatric surgery, but also gallstones and cirrhotic liver disease can sometimes uh, worsen in, in the initial period postoperatively. Um, one of the commoner, not, not the commoner operations, but one of the operations that is being more and oftenly, uh, more frequently performed now is the uh, gastric bypass. And um, that's often being performed as a revisional surgery for a previous gastric band. And those patients do have more complications and they are more prone to things like leaks and stitches and ulcers and internal hernias. They are slightly at risk of a dumping syndrome and they can get actually a, hyper a relative hyperinsulinemic state. And one of the issues that's currently being debated is whether this should be done as a one-stage or a two-stage procedure. Um, data as is hard to come by and there was a very good slide that Ian produced about the uh, complication rates and the morbidity and mortality from bariatric surgery. The largest study that I could find was from 160, nearly 162,000 patients with a BMI of 46 and an age of 45 years. And the 30-day mortality in this meta-analysis from JAMA surgery was 0.08% um, in that series, which is lower than total hip replacement and lower than very many forms of um, uh, elective surgery. Uh, a slightly older study from circulation using a meta-analysis looked at the different subtypes and as was said before, the, the mortality in the short term from uh, a gastric band is very low and obviously with increasing revisional surgery, um, we would expect potentially that that mortality may go up. Um, it's likely too that um, studies from uh, that represent a complete picture of a population, for example, from a whole state database or Medicare data, perhaps would have higher mortalities than those from published observational studies or from randomised trials, which tend to only have highly selected patients undergoing these procedures. The obesity of paradox is what we're going to spend a bit of time on now, and um, it appears that the overweight and obese do better and the underweight do worse, both in long-term... Um, uh, in long-term uh, outcomes and in surgery. And there are potential mechanisms and there are potential um, artefacts in that assessment. So um, there are mechanisms other than a true effect and that would be that more aggressive earlier medical therapy and closer observation occurs in those that are overweight and obese. They're actually able to have better cardioprotective therapy. The obese may well be younger when they're diagnosed with various medical conditions. And there are methods issues in most studies. So the whole concept of um, body mass index uh, we'll talk about. And then the way body mass index is categorised, um, the fact that some weights in large studies are self-reported. And there's all, obviously also surgical selection issues. So if there's a, this, the lower risk patients may be being selected. Then there's also a number of confounders. And it's very important when reading these studies to look at the presence of confounders because for example, age, body mass index generally increases with age from the, about the age of 20 to about the age of 60, and then normal body mass index falls after the age of 60. Um, there's the whole concept of smoking confounding on um, body mass index. So um, people that smoke a lot tend to weigh less than patients that don't smoke. The concept of cardiovascular fitness and various other factors such as socioeconomic status. One thing that can't be ignored is that the extra effort and planning in the last five to ten years that's gone into the management of the bariatric patient. So all hospitals nowadays would have 
virtually a team of people that, that manages and cares for the bariatric patient with ultra-specialised equipment. There's um, clinical pathways, there's a, and there's a group of enthusiasts that help manage these patients. And the, the importance of that effort can't be underestimated. Uh, the care of the bariatric patient involves uh, a really a complex pathway and just managing the patient in isolation is, is not altogether straightforward. So there's organisational aspects that are get put into managing the patient, there's risk mit mitigation strat strategies, specialised equipment, um, uh, there tends to be a multidisciplinary team involved in the care of these patients. And we have seen that um, the, probably the largest study, which is from, from um, JAMA recently, pooling 141 studies shows that all-cause mortality relative to normal weight was actually lowest in the overweight, overweight group, which is a BMI of th um, uh, um, 25 to 30. And that group had the lowest long-term and short-term mortality compared to the normal weight group. And this led us to the, leads to the concept of the J or the U-shaped um, uh, survival curve. Some of which is actually due to the way that BMI is measured. So if you have broad categories of BMI, it will make it look like the overweight do better. And this is a reanalysis of some of the studies. And probably one of the better studies looks at body mass index in patients with um, uh, adults with type 2 diabetes, which is the nurse's health study, where they actually had very good detail Collect, uh, detailed data collection and a 15-year follow-up, they found no obesity paradox in non-smokers or the age, age less than 65. And we can see from this that BMI explains about 50% of the cardiovascular mortality, but not all. In the intensive care unit, there's actually conflicting data. So some of the earlier studies which looked at morbid obesity was an, as an indeterminate um, predictor of death among surgical critical ill patients. But if we look at some local data from South Australia, the 12 month survival uh, in patients with morbid obesity was actually better than um, those that were underweight or normal weight. And probably the best and most recent study uh, looked at sepsis in older Americans and their one year outcomes. And um, obesity and morbid obesity um, were protective compared to those that were underweight and normal weight. The largest study uh, published recently comes from 62 Dutch intensive care units, 150,000 patients. And if you see from here, the, um, the ICU mortality rate for all patients was about 14%, and it was actually, it fell as BMI increased. So we went from 16% mortality in the patients that were underweight to 12% mortality in the patients that were overweight. And the hospital mortality fell commensurately with a, um, a mortality of 27% in those that were underweight and 17% in those that were overweight. And this is relative to a BMI of 25. So this study is probably the, the best of its kind and, it, and did risk adjust for severity of illness in this group. And we can see that the underweight do much worse than the uh, overweight and obese group. And this is probably the largest and biggest study of its kind that hasn't shown a convincing J or U-shaped um, uh, path uh, relationship. So the potential mechanisms of a true protective effect of obesity and cardiovascular disease um, really are the limitations of BMI. And we can see on the picture on, on my left there that um, BMI is not necessarily the best um, uh, predictor of obesity. So as a general principle, um, uh, you know, weight and BMI do correlate, but not all the time. And also, the obese possibly have lower atrial natriuretic peptide levels. They have an attenuated response to the renin angiotensin system. Um, and it's clearly been put forward that uh, that, uh, that um, cardiovascular disease in a normal and underweight person is a different disease process to those in, with overweight or obese. And there's increased muscle mass in those that are obese. Um, and it's been argued that there's actually the muscle mass that's protective rather than the weight being detrimental. And all these studies still are not proven cause and effect all we can see really, until we have a better understanding of the mechanism, is that there's an association. 
But uh, as John has pointed out, all fat is not equal. And uh, we've talked about um, central obesity. So the best study of this kind in the, in the recent uh, literature was in a French intensive care unit where they looked at patients, general intensive care patients who had a foot stay in the intensive care unit of greater than 48 hours. And they looked at sagittal abdominal diameter. So they got some calipers and measured the sagittal ab abdominal diameter with uh, some calipers. And they found that those with central obesity had um, a much higher mortality and was a much better predictor of mortality than, than BMI. And this obviously is in the general um, population as well, where waist circumference and waist hip ratios are probably better predictors than BMI, but much harder to obtain. And John's also talked about the difference between um, subcutaneous adiposity and visceral adiposity. In sepsis and obesity, it becomes much more interesting. So the study from the crit critical care medicine um, in that older American population looked at one-year sepsis mortality. Now, it must be borne in mind that the underweight group and the normal weight group had an average age of 80, and the overweight and obese group had an average weight, uh, age of 70. So even allowing for the risk model, <laughs> accounting for those factors, there is always some concerns that the model, the statistical model is not accurate or not good enough to detect small differences. It's pretty clear that obesity is a pro-inflammatory state, that adipose tissue is a metabolically active organ in critical illness and has roles in energy storage, endocrine function and inflammatory modulation and there is at least 40 mediators being described and if you're a 70 kilo person, that weighs 140 kilos, then you've got 70 kilograms of metabolically and endocrinologically active adipose tissue um, uh, uh, playing a very active role in your critical illness. One of the more interesting studies looks at the morphology and function of fat cells and macrophages, and they actually change. So the, the, the type of macrophage and the type of fat cell in critical illness changes, and um, uh, it's postulated that the change in fat cells in critical illness and the change in the role, type and function of macrophages as they enter fat tissue has a sub substantial effect. And then uh, John's talked about adipokines, leptin, adiponectin and resistin, all of which may play a role. So the obesity paradox and sepsis may relate to the fact that cachexia is actually bad and much more important uh, as a predictor of um, uh, bad outcomes than obesity. And cachexia, by and large, is less likely in trauma and surgical patients, possibly explaining some aspect of the trauma and surgery um, obesity paradox. It's pretty clear that the obese patient has less protein catabolism with critical illness, and there's enhanced pa aspects of triglyceride and glucose storage, making fat tissue uh, a more energy efficient storage mechanism in critical illness. The high leptin levels and low adiponectin levels may be beneficial early for their inflammatory role in sepsis, and it's been postulated that lipoproteins may actually act as endotoxin scavengers. In cardiac surgery, um, there's a major advantage with looking at cardiac surgical patients because um, they have their weight and height accurately measured, so we can get a very accurate BMI. And by and large, it's very hard to prove that obesity has detrimental effects in cardiac surgery. A study from Yapadel showed that increased infection rates occurred and renal failure was more pro pro prominent, but they excluded patients with a BMI of less than 21, uh, less than 20. And some local data, if we look at about 15,000 patients from Prince Charles Hospital, we see that that underweight group is far more likely to cause um, you concerns in the perioperative period. Now, it's very clear that the underweight group represent a very different um, subtype of patients, more likely to be undergoing complex surgery, more, li more likely to be having significant heart failure, for example, preoperatively. But that is the group that perhaps we should be looking at more. And with regard to a special interest of mine, just one slide, if we look at mechanical cardiac support or ECMO in this group of patients, then the best available evidence says that the weight shouldn't be an issue. Um, the largest patient we've put on ECMO was 150 kilos, uh, and um, 
cannulation, although slower, is not more difficult than, than others. And this is data from the, um, the multinational database from Michigan, um, published in intensive care medicine recently and by the group from Sydney. And um, uh, weight and weight was no, not a predictor of um, poor outcomes. The final paradox that's worth discussing is the social paradox where um, overweight patients are more likely to be socially disadvantaged, more likely to have lower incomes and uh, more likely to have lower education levels than those that actually have access to the optimal form of therapy at the moment. So a study from the UK suggested that up to 5.4% of the population uh, of the adult population in England would potentially benefit from bariatric surgery. Just looking at the total demand that potentially may occur. And similarly, Australian data suggests that unfortunately those that are in the greatest need may have the least access. So in summary, um, it's pretty clear that there's been a major improvement in the management of critically ill bariatric patients over time. The obesity paradox has both potential confounders and a potentially real effect, and further investigation is really required to work out why this mechanism may occur. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, and uh, I'm gonna just um, finish off the session with a, a few minutes and some thoughts about where this is all going. Um, and the big picture of some uh, obesity insights that many of the other speakers have drawn on. What I'd like to do is just briefly talk about how big the problem is, um, why some people are fat and what the consequences of that are, both to an individual and a healthcare system, and then what influence that has on our clinical practice, and then we'll throw that open to some questions. Um, it's a big problem, and in Australia it's growing bigger and bigger. We have the uh, honour of now being the fourth fattest in the world, but the uh, fattest in rate. Um, estimates are that up to three in five Australians are either overweight or obese now from the Australian Bureau of Statistics most recent data and it continues to increase. It's ranked behind, only behind smoking and high blood pressure as a major contributor and in Queensland um, this year's data that Dan was mentioning it's now beat those two and it's the number one cause as a general contributor to the burden of disease. John mentioned the um, global burden of disease study um, that talks about you know, these incredible statistics of you know, 2000 and in 2010, 3.4 million deaths across the world, a, a significant contribution to years of life lost, that um, since 1980, the number of adult males with a BMI more than 25 is, is heading up towards 40% now from something under 30%. So this is a large problem across the world, not just uh, um, where we are. You can see in this map, the yellow and red is where people are too fat. Um, and, and Australia gets a, a big yellow tick, as do some other predictable areas. But similarly, it's increasing in its distribution, distribution around the globe. Um, I think this is a useful thought that Jamie Oliver's had, uh, maybe one of the few useful thoughts Jamie Oliver's had, that he, it, you know, there's this huge concentration on deaths from murder and manslaughter, yet there's an enormous amount of diet-related disease in our community and people don't really talk much about it that in fact societal norms um, are increasing. We, we saw some of the, the earlier speakers talk about where BMI of 25 to 30 is sort of normal now that we have increased portion sizes, we have everything has more fat in it than it used to. Um, they make clothes bigger but still call it a size 10 or a size 12 or whatever, particularly in the US. Um, bigger portion sizes, less activity. So that everything about our society is structured um, around obesity. I guess, um, what are the consequences of, of being overweight and obese? Um, we're all aware of physiological, pharmacological consequences, comorbid disease, the metabolic consequences we've so nicely heard about. Um, one of the other things um, is the size. Everything's hard. When you're big, everything's hard. You need special equipment. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I'm not gonna go through the basic physiology and pharmacology, but we clearly are aware it's a multi-system disease. Um, as practicing anaesthetists or intensivists, we're well aware of the respiratory and cardiovascular complications. The issues around drug dosing and how unpredictable that might be. Are we using lean body weight or total body weight or 
which drugs are which. Um, that fatty infiltration of the liver and alterations in drug metabolism is almost universal, the risks of reflux and aspiration. Everybody's not the same, but so that if your BMI is 28, is that the same as it being 48? So they're different, and we've heard that within these individuals, um, metabolically, they may well be different. What is probably clear, once your BMI exceeds 30, you're likely to have some increased risk associated with healthcare interventions. You're probably more likely to have some comorbid disease, like sleep apnea, heart disease, hypertension. But BMI alone is a poor predictor of that. What is a better predictor, probably, is the presence of coexisting disease. So rather than just saying you weigh 120 kilos, um, what other illnesses do you have that go with that? And I guess this is something that, that uh, it, it, I find very interesting, is this concept that's been alluded to of the fit fat. So that not just of a fat cell, but an individual. I, is it possible there are big people who are just big people. And there are some researchers, and this is an article from the European Heart Journal recently, where there are phenotypically, metabolically healthy, big individuals. Um, I'd have to say this is an area of debate in the literature where people um, increasingly say, look, that's actually rubbish. Anyone who's big is unhealthy, and that's all there is to it. Um, and this is not clear. But I guess it starts to lead to why people are fat, and maybe we need to better understand that. And, and uh, this is um, an editorial from the 1924 issue of JAMA entitled, What Causes Obesity? 90 years later from the BMJ, um, do we really know what makes us fat? So we've spent 90 years a as a um, biomedical um, research and clinicians and we still haven't figured out why people are fat. What we do know is that um, obesus is derived from the Latin and it probably has something to do with eating and getting large. Um, it is possible to be big from having bones and muscles, but most commonly it's due to fat and it's a growing problem around the planet. The causes we believe are related to fast food. We'd heard Dan say that um, as fast food was introduced to France, their population became um, more obese that if you look at a survey of Americans, and this is taken from a paper in the New England Journal, the vast majority of Americans believe you're overweight because you're lazy and you eat too much. There's this energy balance hypothesis. Why do we get fat? Because we overeat. How do we know we're overeating? Because you get fat. And why are we getting fat? Because we're overeating and you just go round and round in circles. But as Ian said right at the start, if it was that simple, we should have been able to fix it by now. You should be able to say, well, you need to eat less and do more exercise and it should go away. And, and it hasn't. And so people increasingly realise that maybe we've got this wrong, that maybe there's, you know, is the overeating a cause or a consequence? Is there another model of what could be going on? And we've heard quite elegantly today that there clearly is some endocrine changes that occur. It's not as simple as what you put in um, and what exercise you do, that there are some other changes that occur and that if you go back to this article um, by Gary Taubes, that these competing hypotheses of energy balance um, versus endocrine, we have for maybe the last 90 years put all our eggs in the energy balance basket and maybe we've got it wrong and that's why we're not making any ground and we have increasing problems with global obesity. Maybe we need to look more closely at the endocrine changes that not everybody's the same and there probably is more merit from this point forward at getting better at looking at the molecular and genetic phenotypes of trying to sort out um, the fat fit versus the hypertrophied fat cells uh, that um, everybody's different. And I'd just like to finish off by what are the practical influences apart from extra wide wheelchairs um, a whole floor of our hospital now dedicated to the storage of bariatric equipment so we can get it down readily, having to widen the doorways to get in and out. Um, is this the new normal? Most people I see now, this is a man with uh, life-threatening meningococcal sepsis and no, no one commented on his weight. He's 120 kilos and that's just part of the deal. Um, everything's hard when you go to do it. He was hard to intubate got right up a lobe collapse after you put the tube in. You have to turn the x-ray plate on its side and you still can't fit all of him onto it. 
Um, so the procedures and investigations are harder. It probably increases the likelihood of atelectasis, and you see that um, perioperatively. It probably impedes wound healing and tissue healing, particularly if there are abdominal wounds. And then we think physical therapy after operations and procedures is good for you, and it makes it harder for people to participate in those, and that may be a long-term detriment. But then there's this paradox that maybe in the short and the long term it has some protective properties, but it's really difficult to rule out residual confounders and the, the different diseases or different sources of infection, different thresholds for ICU admission. What's clear is size limits your options and uh, you now have uh, guidelines and these are some Queensland Health guidelines about what patients can have what operations in what hospitals. Um, that people are dictating based on BMI. Uh, I guess of interest to me is, and possibly the audience, is post-operative care. What do you do with these people after you've done an operation? You certainly oxygen's probably good for you, but what about HDU, ICU, and maybe we'll get a couple of minutes to, uh, to get some comments about wh where do you put these people? If everyone's got a BMI of 45, do you need to do something differently with them after the operation? We certainly don't have the ICU beds to put everyone in. Um, Nothing is straightforward. This is a man who um, got breathless and presented to me late one evening. And, um, you know, you can see the obvious difficulties you're going to have securing his airway and doing other things for him. That we talked about investigations. Um, you're going to have to go to the zoo to have your CT scan. That um, super obese people scanned at the vet hospital in the horse CT scanners. In fact, it's interesting talking to our radiology department. They've solved the weight issue. Um, they've beefed up the table. So our new CT scanner takes more than 300 kilos on the table, but it still only takes 77 centimetres through the donut. And so we have plenty of people now. Once you're over about 220 kilos, you won't fit in a 77 centimetre hole. So it's not the weight per se, it's the highs, size. And size limits investigations. It's hard to get blood pressure off and need invasive blood pressure. It's hard to get ECG. The voltage is a small. Vascular access is difficult. Airway management's hard. Clinical examination is a real trap and, you know, the exom abdominal exam looking for peritonitis and surgical complications in someone who has 30 centimetres of abdominal fat is um, very misleading at best. Imaging is hard, ECMO is difficult, um, prone ventilation, this is a person in our ICU who was only 120 kilos, but it's a big effort to flip them prone when they're hypoxic. Um, so I guess in conclusion, from my point of view, obese patients are part of routine practice now and it's likely to increase in the years ahead. We've got very skilled at conquering the technical challenges of morbid obesity. Um, I'm sure many of the people in this room, it's their daily practice dealing with these very large patients. But I just wonder if a better understanding of the alterations in metabolism and the risk stratification in fact may provide some opportunities to further improve these people's clinical outcomes. Um, and with that I'm going to stop there that maybe we need to look more closely at what we're doing. Thank you very much. <clears throat> if I could invite um, all the speakers back up maybe to the stage and we'll take some questions. And I just remind people there's a short lunch break today. So uh, we'll try and wrap up here by midday so that you've got um, till one o'clock then for lunch. And there's a, a towel for each of our speakers um, as a gift from the conference organisers um, if they get a question correct. <laughs> Do we have any questions from the floor? Yes. Uh, uh, there's extensive research into ghrelin, leptin, and a host of other uh, sort of factors in that area. So there's there's um, a number of groups, both in Australia and worldwide. So, yeah. No cure. Well, that's, uh, I think that just highlights how rudimentary our understanding is. Uh, the more we scratch the surface, we more the more we recognise that we don't know, and so. Some of these factors which have only been discovered in the last 10 years, we realise now how important they are in terms of this rebound. And some of the, the new dietary interventions are trying to uh, 
get a handle on how these uh, neuroendocrine factors are playing an important role in the rebound so that we can modulate the production of these neuroendocrine factors to at least delay the rebound because if you prevent people from getting back to their original weight for another five years then that's another five years improved quality of life reduced health risks etc um, just behind you we'll just move up there Absolutely. So if you lose 10 to 20% of your body weight, you need to starve yourself for life despite the hormonal uh, mechanisms for the rest of your days. And trying to fight hunger for the rest of your days is nigh impossible in the environment we live in. So it's tricky. It's not as simple as just ghrelins and leptins. I mean, we take out the entire stomach for conditions. And I have a 120 kilo gentleman who for 15 years has no stomach and no ghrelin. It's multifactorial. It's not as, it would be lovely to say it's just a leptin or a ghrelin issue. Is that up the back? I think our foods are high, high energy, so they've got high density. Whether it's one category of food or not, that's a ongoing. Um, there's a, a, a group in Sydney who've been pushing the protein leverage hypothesis, <coughs> and so there's an argument that goes that we've evolved to defend our protein intake. And as our, if we look at the dietary uh, uh, components over the last 20 or 30 years, the, the amount of protein in our daily diet has gone down as the carbohydrate and fat has gone up. And so with this leverage hypothesis, what we do is we defend our protein. So we, on the basis of that, we, let's say we eat 10 grams of protein a day. To, to, to accommodate that, we have to eat 300 grams excess carbohydrate and fat. And when you, when you multiply that on an annual basis, that leads to increased weight gain. And this... As this is a, a, a fascinating study which started out in insects, in locusts, uh, and has been extrapolated through small animals to primates and now humans, and the evidence looks uh, reasonably compelling. So I think, again, it suggests that the evolutionary sort of traits that we've, we've acquired are driving much of our behaviour, and then we've changed our environment over the last three or four decades. Is that up here? Green shirt. Yeah, I think um, it's a, a really good question. So I think part of it is societal. Uh, and if we look at those uh, ethnicities where having a fuller figure as being considered to be a real positive, you will see that it's, it's the sort of higher societal, uh, higher components of their society, which have generally been sort of more round. Um, and so it demonstrates wealth. Uh, from a, again, from, from a historical perspective, humans haven't had excess food. And across the globe, we've struggled to feed ourselves. And so really, it's this, over the last 50 years, that's, we've, we've completely changed the equation. And so now we're in constant postprandial state. In America now, they're inventing a fourth meal. So that, again, and I think one of the things that we, we fail to consider is just how important the marketing of food products is. Um, there's a reason that all the companies invest billions of dollars annually, and that's because they recoup multiple billions for every billion they spend and the the health organizations can't compete with that the in the u.s if they were to spend their annual budget one of the one of the largest institutes over there if they were to spend their annual budget they would be able to compete with pepsi and coke for one day uh, 
and it would be open slather for pets in court for the rest of the year. Um, and you know, these, the companies don't spend their money blindly. They spend it because it brings more money in. And I think this is one of the big things. And so the, the governments have to take a hard stand. And I don't want to get too political here, but I think that's, you know, it's a societal problem. I don't, I don't think that really addresses your question, but from a, an evolutionary perspective, we've evolved to be very efficient at harnessing the energy when it comes along, and we don't need to be that efficient now. So there's been a positive drive for these genetics to have, to have uh, been consolidated within our gene pool, but now because we've changed the environment, those genetics are working against us. And we haven't spoken about epigenetics, but that's one of the reasons why the landscape is changing so fast as well. Is there one more question, last one up the back? Thank you. Uh, 30 years ago when we started doing bariatric surgery, we used to put dextrose infusions up on these patients while they were fasting uh, because someone had said that their, their acute fasting increased their platelet stickiness due to some hormonal thing and we don't seem to do it anymore. Is that because the science was wrong or there's no evidence for that? I think, I think that's all been poo-pooed now. Is it, are you talking about uh, thromboembolic risks? Um, Platelet clumping. I mean, thromboembolism is a very low risk now in with laparoscopic surgery. There's less activation of the extrinsic coagulation pathway, and we have less PEs than ever before because it's a, it's a keyhole operation. We, we treat those. We, we use all the usual precautions, uh, including you know thinners. But no, that I'm, I haven't seen that used for a long time. Okay. All right, we might, uh, in the interest of time, draw the session to a close. So if you'd join me in thanking all our speakers for an interesting session. Thanks.